Proseguiamo con il prossimo relatore, Michel Rigon, che lavora nello stesso centro di Michela Newcastle e ci parlerà o per di valutazione e riabilitazione motoria. Buongiorno a tutti, mi chiamo Michelle Eagle, io lavoro con Michela Guglieri a Newcastle, um, e basta parlare italiano, um, parlare inglese, no. ok, veramente. So, um, I'm talking about uh, assessments for clinical trials, particularly in calpianopathy, and as we've heard from everybody so far, we don't have a really strong natural history database from which we can design the outcome measures for a clinical trial. And we really need to get together to work collaboratively in an international way so that we can have enough <coughs> patients to really form strong opinions and get robust data for, um, for outcome measures. And one of the first steps would be to gather together patients um, expert physiotherapists, research clinicians, people who have cl clinical trial experience so that they can evaluate the current outcome measures that are available and look at the generic outcome measures and try to work out some disease specific outcome measures that might be appropriate in calpianopathy. And this is what we've done in several other diseases in a very successful way. And we need to learn from other diseases. Um, we're several years now into clinical trials and we've experienced significant delays in Duchenne and SMA because we didn't have specific outcome measures and insufficient natural history data to satisfy the pharmacological requirements uh, from the pharmaceutical companies. And it's important to recognise that a trial can fail, not because the drug doesn't work, but because the outcome measures are inappropriate or insensitive. And in Dysferlin, 2i, Duchenne, SMA, other conditions, there are projects specifically designed to develop trial-ready assessments for these specific conditions, and this is where we need to be for, this, for uh, calpianopathy. So when you're designing outcome measures, you need to think about the disease that you are working with. Think about the things that might affect the progression of the disease. Think about the pattern of the disease. Think about different modules for different areas, whether it's proximal, distal, upper limb, lower limb, or trunk. And then think about the contractures or the weakness that might affect the motor performance. And of course, aging has an impact on um, the way that somebody might progress, whether it be a small child who is developing motor skills or an older person who is getting weaker simply because they're getting older. So the way to develop outcome measures is to have a standardised approach to do it. So you hypothesise a framework upon which you will work. You then adjust this framework and develop the instrument which will be the tool that you measure um, with. You confirm your framework and you assess how the measurement actually works in reality and you collect and analyse and interpret data and nobody ever gets everything right first time around, so you will then modify the instrument, the tool, the outcome measure that you are working for. And it might be that you have to go back to the beginning, but hopefully not. Hopefully you will then go back to collecting data and remodifying the instrument. And this is an iterative process which is essential to develop proper outcome measures. So what has been successful in other diseases? The clinical outcome study in dysphernopathy has been a very useful process to go through. We met first in 2010 to decide which assessments were appropriate in Naples at, um, in the summer. It was very hot. Um, I think some of us were at that meeting. Um, and the situation then was exactly as we have for carpianopathy. Little evidence for discriminatory tests. 
And the functional measures that we chose at that meeting um, were chosen uh, really because we didn't have anything specific for dyspherinopathy. And so we looked at uh, outcome measures that might be useful. So the muscle strength tests were based on the pattern of weakness. And the aim was then to collect data for a year and then to evaluate the data that we had and to decide whether it was robust, relevant, feasible, whether it was able to detect change. And then once we had that data, to make decisions about which assessments would be useful to continue with and make us trial ready and which assessments we were missing and which needed to be thrown out. So I'm going to stand up for the physiotherapist here. The physiotherapist or clinical evaluator is a key person in this process. The physiotherapist gather the data that is used to determine whether a trial is successful or not. And physiotherapists have been involved in the development of many of the outcome measures that are used in clinical trials. And we also work hard to standardise their application by writing manuals of operation um, and training physiotherapists in a very standardised way. In the clinical outcome study for dysphernopathy, um, we did some rash analysis. And this is a very specific um, kind of statistical analysis which is used to look at the performance of functional scales. And this analysis invested the ability of individual items within scales, particularly the MFM and the North Star Ambulatory Assessment, to see whether it measured what it was supposed to measure. And that's what is meant by seeing if it measures the underlying construct of the scale. So it's whether the items target the range of, in, of abilities across the whole cohort, whether the items match the order of difficulty and the clinical knowledge of the condition, and it also looked at whether we could combine scales to make a, a robust scale specifically for dysphernopathy. And this analysis was performed by Anna Mayhew and Meredith James, who are physiotherapists who work with me and Michaela in Newcastle. So this is called a threshold map. And what it does is it tells you whether the items in the scale are ordered correctly. So do they start from, from easy to difficult? And within each item, are the grades appropriate? Do you go from one grade to another in a specific order? So do you go from a grade two, which is the best, to a grade one, and then to a zero? Is it a logical progression? And what we see with North Star, all of these colored ones are where we had logical progression. The missing bits are where we had what are called disordered thresholds. So these items didn't work insofar as the grades weren't accurate. This is the MFM, and you'll see that in dyspherinopathy, the MFM didn't work quite so well. There were many items that were disordered. Only seven thresholds worked well. However, we decided that we would look more closely and this is a, um, a picture that shows you how an ordered threshold looks. So you have uh, clear lines between each of the grades. This is a disordered threshold and you can see that there are only two grades which are used. So this was for jumping and in adults you either jump or you don't. So this helps us by looking at these graphs to design the scale properly. This is called a targeting map. The pink are patients, and these blue along the bottom are items. And what this tells you is whether the items that you have match the patient population that you have. And you can see that there's a reasonable spread, a few little gaps, and a gap at the end, so there's a ceiling effect. So what we did, um, based on this natural history data that was collected internationally, was to rescore, add in some MFM items, and here we have an absolutely beautiful threshold map, which shows us that the scale hopefully will work correctly. So looking at possible outcome measures in CALPIN, we have strength testing, various different kinds, functional testing, and what we really want is a CALPINopathy specific functional outcome measure. Possibly a version of the North Star, but possibly something different. Uh, we want time tests because these will um, negate the uh, ceiling effect that we have. 
but we also want patient reported outcome measures. What the patient thinks, what the person who has this disease has, is almost more important than what the clinician thinks, um, but it is less um, objective, and so that's why we still need to have clinician reported outcome measures. The functional assessments could be related to the performance of the upper limb, which is a new outcome measure developed um, by a, a group of physiotherapists. Um, could be an extended north star for calpinopathy, time stairs, tug, and these are all pictures of these tests being performed. They're appropriate for both adults and for children over about the age of four or five. And this is an important sentence. To be relevant and meaningful for the patient, the assessment must, must reflect the patient's function in the perspective of daily living. And another way of saying that is that the tests that we perform must be clinically meaningful um, in order for them to matter. So I'm going to move on to um, rehabilitation for calpinopathy. And I know this is a, a very rushed um, movement through this particular topic. I could talk all day, um, but I'm sure you wouldn't appreciate that very much. So I'm going to just mention a few things about um, rehabilitation. And I'm blowing the trumpet of physiotherapists today because that's who I'm standing up for. And currently physiotherapy is the only um, treatment for many of the neuromuscular diseases, and including calpinopathy. And what the physiotherapist needs to know is the disease itself. So we need to know what the likely prognosis is, what the likely complications are, so that we can be proactive in our management and treatment of somebody with calpinopathy. If we know where the disease is going, if we know where the contractures are likely to be, then we can plan appropriately to try and prevent these problems coming, because it's easier to prevent a problem than it is to resolve it. So what is physiotherapy? Prevent, maintain, maybe even improve. It's enabling a person through physical means to maintain their potential, to reach their potential, sorry, and to maintain their function and ability. We need to anticipate problems. We need to be proactive. And we need to assess the, the patient carefully so that we can understand what kind of program to develop. And the sorts of things we do would be exercise, stretching, um, hydrotherapy, <coughs> sports, postural advice, wheelchair advice, and chest physiotherapy if it's required. So the assessment could be any of the outcome measures that I've mentioned before. And then we also need to look at the problems. So talk at the patient and talk to the patient and understand how these outcome measures reflect the actual problems that the patient is having. And then we can work on developing a program. So briefly talking about hydrotherapy, most people with neuromuscular diseases love to have hydrotherapy. It's relaxing, it's um, therapeutic, um, it does lots and lots of muscles all in one go, so it's very time efficient. It's essential to have warm water. People with um, wasted muscle do not do well in cold water. Um, it's too uncomfortable, it, they don't have the ability to shiver to keep warm, and it makes their muscles stiff and uncomfortable. So warm water is essential. It's beneficial at any stage, whether you're ambulant or not. It enables active concentric exercise, which is important. And it also assists the muscles which aren't able to work against gravity. Um, so muscles which you can't move very well on land, you can move very well in water. As with most things, there is very little objective evidence, but for sure, if you ask any patients, they will say that they enjoy hydrotherapy and they feel the benefit from it. So why is stretching so important? It's really boring doing stretching, but it's so important that you do. And there is no point at all in stretching once a week or once a month. Stretching has to be done every day. If you are trying to counteract something which is an integral part of the disease and also which is accentuated by the posture that you are in, then the exercise, the stretch, has to be done on a very regular basis. It prevents or delays permanent contractures, it maintains comfortable movement, it enables continued walking and standing, more comfortable sleep, reduces asymmetry, 
And for people who have significant plant deflection contractures, if you can maintain a 90 degree angle with your foot, you can keep on wearing nice shoes. And that's really important for both adults and children. So moving on to active exercise, healthy people are advised to exercise aerobically three times a week for 30 minutes. This is the same for people with a neuromuscular disease. And there is evidence building now that exercise is not harmful in neuromuscular disease and to do nothing is more harmful. So sitting in your wheelchair all day long or sitting on your couch all day long, not doing anything is going to be detrimental to your function and also to your mental well-being. So use a static cycle, swim, cycle, walk, whatever you can do, whatever stage you are at, there is something that you can do. Orthotics are a very important part of physiotherapy management. I'm just going to mention contracture correction devices. These are a specific device that don't just hold the muscle in a place or the joint in a place, they actually actively stretch. And there is some evidence in neuromuscular disease that two hours a day is effective, effective at improving range. And it does this by this little lock, which I'm sorry, you can't see very well here, but they're a very useful way to um, actually stretch. It's like having a physiotherapist work on your foot for two hours. And we found that these are very acceptable to people with neuromuscular disease and often when people can't wear ankle foot orthoses or night splints, they will tolerate these much better. Wheelchairs are a very important thing to, um, to consider. They are not a death sentence when you go into a wheelchair. A wheelchair is an opportunity to be free and to be able to move without restriction and to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Standing adjustable height wheelchairs are beautiful, they're excellent, they're expensive, but they're worth the money. They can delay contractures if you can stand up in this wheelchair. Um, and the social and emotional, emotional benefits are really um, very useful. You can have all sorts of adaptations to a wheelchair, for example, somewhere to hold your beer. And in England, that's what would normally happen. In Italy, you might have to have a special adaptation for a glass of wine, which is good. And powered mobility, not just electric wheelchairs, but other kinds of powered mobility. People should have appropriate powered mobility once walking ability impacts on their lifestyle and quality of life. Whether that's a snowmobile because you live in the country where it's snowy or something like this, like a Segway to get around town, it's important to be able to get to where you want to be to do what you want to do and not be stuck. So, uh, oops. So this is my second last slide. Um, and this is just to show um, examples of how important it is to stay fit because then you can have sport and fun and this is the England wheelchair football team which has people with SMA, with FSH, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and they um, happily are doing a lot better than the England um, normal football team. Moving on. Um, but there is a lot of work to be done um, for calpinopathy. We can be very pragmatic from a clinical perspective, but for measurement, accuracy and knowledge of the disease is absolutely crucial and we must work hard so that when we have um, a trial that we want to use internationally, we will have robust, reliable, repeatable, oops, standardised measurements so that we can evaluate the impact of any intervention, whether it be a pharmacological or a physiotherapy intervention. Thank you very much. Right.